Yeah, so I think like many people, I enjoy uh, beautiful landscapes. I'm currently in a rather beautiful botanical gardens. And if one is comfortable and relaxed, it's easy to to wax lyrical about the, the glories of nature and one thinks of wildlife documentaries. Um, but in a very, very important sense, this is extremely misleading. And that if right now you weren't sitting comfortably, but instead were extremely thirsty, perhaps dying of thirst, racked by parasitism, disease, being, as unfortunately is the case, if you were being uh, uh, eaten alive or asphyxiated uh, or disemboweled by a predator, your perspective on the living world is radically different. Um, we tend to think that uh, people from alien regimes, North Korea or something like that, are the victims of propaganda. One doesn't on the whole seriously consider that one might have been a victim of, of propaganda oneself, but wildlife documentaries and the narrative they impose on nature give us a, a very sugar-coated, disnified conception of the living world and unfortunately in nature uh, starvation, disease, parasitism is endemic. Um, that's the bad news. The good news is that essentially with later this century and beyond it will be possible to phase out involuntary suffering not just with humans but in the rest of the living world too. Thankfully uh, one a group of organisms we don't need to worry about ethically, not for themselves anyway, is plants. Uh, occasionally uh, someone asks, well, aren't, can't plants feel pain? Um, no, for all sorts of reasons this seems extremely unlikely that there could be no selection pressure in favour of energetically expensive nervous uh, systems in any organism without the capacity for rapid self-propelled motion. So uh, in the case of uh, plants with their uh, cellulose uh, cell walls, um, no, uh, I I essentially not subjects of experience we can behave uh, as we choose towards plants. Could, uh, obviously one has to take seriously the possibility that one might be mistaken but any form of animism is not really consistent with the scientific world picture. There is a, a discipline in evolutionary aesthetics that explains the kind of things the average human finds beautiful. Evolutionary aesthetics explains many of our preferences for uh, a degree of open uh, countryside, not too many places for lions to be hiding, blue sky, the kinds of environment that were conducive to the reproductive success of our ancestors on the African savannah. Uh, and sure enough, uh, like many people, I do enjoy the beauties of nature so long as I'm not thinking too closely of what they involve. In terms of post-humans, what will post-human aesthetics be like? I think this is very, very difficult to say. For a start, Immersive virtual reality will enable each of us to live in designer paradises of our own choosing if we want to. Uh, if you like the, the virgin wilderness without the nasty Anopheles mosquitoes. Um, but as well as that, one of the consequences of understanding molecular biology of the brain is that it will be possible to isolate the molecular signature of beauty and radically enrich and amplify our aesthetic sensibilities and it may well be that post-human life, life for example is generically sublimely beautiful to an extent that just isn't physiologically feasible today. Yeah, so I, I could talk a little bit about my conception of the good life but I think the point of the abolitionist project, paradise engineering, is not is, is is that it's not a case of any one person's uh, utopian vision or engineering. On the contrary, by recalibrating the hedonic treadmill, it simply enables you to lead a kind of life and be the kind of person you would like to be if nature had been had been kinder.
Yes, why has nature not invented the wheel, given it might seem that uh, uh, creatures that uh, uh, possessed uh, uh, wheels would be much more successful than those uh, that didn't. Uh, the reason seems to be that uh, uh, that kind of locomotion would entail crossing gaps in the evolutionary fitness landscape that are prohibited by natural selection. On sometimes Here's the counter-argument of paradise engineering that it would need, lead to uniformity and a, a, a lack of diversity, with diversity, the assumption being, is somehow inherently good. But though in one sense phasing out cystic fibrosis or depression leads to greater uniformity, in another sense genetic engineering biotechnology opens up the opportunity for fabulously greater uh, a variety and richness because we can design uh, genomes in principle at any rate design life forms and states of consciousness that could not could not have evolved by natural selection if we have if, if there is uh, uh, life that exists elsewhere in our Hubble volume we discover life uh, and we're talking about primordial life here not uh, engineered life, then I think it's highly likely if it's multicellular that there will be predation, uh, that uh, there will be some form of convergent evolution. You'll, we, one will find probably the same Darwinian principles of natural selection. Um, that's not to say, I mean, when, uh, if and when organisms evolve sufficiently cognitively sophisticated to master science, to be capable of re-engineering themselves, editing their own genetic source code, then all bets are off, uh, I don't know. Um, but uh, if today we were to discover life elsewhere in the galaxy, primordial life, one might well find that it was not radically different from traditional life on Earth, i.e. it would probably be carbon-based and reliant on liquid water. Uh, this isn't, as it may sound, uh, uh, arbitrary carbon chauvinism, but it seems that the properties of uh, the valence properties of carbon are functionally unique, the properties of liquid water are functionally unique, and no other chemistry for primordial life seems to be feasible, or at least one can make a case this is so. Of course, I could be completely uh, uh, confounded here, but uh, tentatively that would be my prediction.